Hello, Facebook world. I think I am live right now. Tiffany's going to give me a thumbs up, but I'm fairly certain I am. We are super excited because this month, March, is Women's History Month. And actually on Monday, it's International Women's Day. So our talk today is all about the ladies. Um, and it's specifically, we're going to talk about women that have careers in the STEM field. And if that's a new word for you, STEM stands for science, technology, engineering, and math. Um, I'm going to, oof, sorry, technology. So women are, oh, and a really cool thing is that we have a special guest with us. She's a friend of mine uh, who lives in South Dakota. She's actually behind the slide here. So she's going to hop on after I'm done talking about some kind of historical facts and um, just numbers about women in science. So women are underrepresented in science in every country and around the world. The numbers on this map, map show what percentage of the world's science researchers are women in each region. So if you guys take a look, you can see those little numbers that are in bubbles. You can see that only 32% of all researchers in North America and Western Europe are women while 19% of the researchers are women in South and, West, South and West Asia. And as you can see, women make up less than 50% of all researchers in each region across the world. And I'm really enunciating those words because those are very small numbers in the field of science. When you add up each region, women actually only make up 30% of all the researchers in the world. These researchers study anything within science, technology, and innovation. Some of you might not have heard the word innovation. An innovator is someone who helps to come up with new things from existing ideas. Maybe like the Mars rover is a pretty innovative idea. They are innovators but they use what they already knew to help create something different. So like the Mars rover, we have been to the moon before, so using that technology, but thinking of new ways to go further out into space. This graph shows how many women compared to men received a bachelor's degree in each of the STEM fields. And I know the numbers might be kind of small for you guys. Um, we can always put this slide up if you guys are interested later on. One of the two columns, the one on the right, is always 2014. I'm reading that wrong. So the pink is the percentage of women that in the field, and blue is the percentage of men. So you can see that the two far left columns, which represent degrees in environmental and computer sciences in, in 2014, women only made up 19 and 18 percent of the graduates. That's a very tiny number out of 100%. In 2014, women made up thir only 38% of Earth, atmospheric, and ocean science graduates, and 39% of physical science graduates, and 42, a little bit higher number, of mathematics graduates. The two STEM fields where women outnumbered men, at least in 2014, is in biological and agricultural sciences. Those people study life and farming type stuff, with 58% of the graduates being women and social sciences and psychology, with 62% of that being women. While those two fields seem to have many women graduates, there is still a huge gap with women graduating with engineering and computer sciences degrees. Um, in one current study, I found that uh, more women and then ever are becoming uh, overrepresented in the STEM force, but they are still outnumbered one to four in STEM jobs held by women, which is crazy numbers. Have you guys ever heard of a saying that it's a women, woman's job to cook? It's kind of an older saying. Uh, well, Marie Curie, who was a famous scientist or physicist and scientist, cooked up a lot of innovations. She and her husband discovered several elements, including polonium and radium. She is one of two women to ever receive the Nobel Peace Prize in physics. She was awarded this prize in 1903. 
as Marie Curie once said, life is not easy for any of us, but what of that? We must be, we must persevere and above all confidence, it, have confidence in ourselves. We must believe that we are gifted for something and this must be attained. Growing up, Marie Curie faced many challenges and had to leave her home country to pursue her education in physics. Curry also said, nothing in life is to be feared. It is only to be understood. Now it's time to understand more so that we may fear less, which is, I mean, if that was a long time ago, still pretty good for today. Now you might've heard that women are too caring or maybe too sensitive. Well, thanks to this caring human, Jane Goodall, she's an environmentalist and advocate of animals. She has helped redefine the way we think about wild and captive animals and humanity. Jane Goodall was one of three women to set out to study wild populations of primates. And in 1960, Goodall was taxed with caring or studying chimps in the wild, something no one had ever been able to do. To really understand chimpanzee behavior, you have to watch them and become accepted member of their lives. Jane Goodall studied chimpanzees for over 60 years and has helped create more programs and new programs and awareness for animals, especially endangered and captive animals. Today, Jane Goodall travels the globe speaking to people and encourages them to look critically at their world and make a difference. Some great Goodall or Jane Goodall quotes are, let us develop respect for all living things. Let us try to replace violence and intolerance with understanding and compassion and love. Jane Goodall believes that every individual matters. Every individual has a role to play. Every individual makes a difference. If you'd like to learn more about Jane Goodall, there is a movie about her called Jane, and you can find it on Disney+. Plus. Uh, we watched it as a family. It was amazing. I've actually had a chance to see her speak here in Spokane at Gonzaga, and it was really a life-changing experience for me. Um, she's an incredible woman. So if you ever get a chance to watch that movie, I think you'd really enjoy it. And my last quote is, you cannot get through a single day without having an impact on the world around you. What you do makes a difference and you have to decide what kind of difference you're going to make. Have you heard that women, oh, we have people online. Uh, Nisha, Nisa, Henry, Goodwin. Oh, <laughs> Sorry. Uh, Kesslin, it's good to see you. Thanks for jumping on. One of my very strong first grade female scientists. Thank you. Have you ever heard that women pay too much attention to detail? Uh, well, Maria Ter Teresa Ruiz Gonzalez is an astronomer, astronomer from Chile. She's the first female astronomer in Chile and has discovered two planet planetary nebulae. Oh, there's lots of words today which are areas in space where stars can be born. Crazy. Sometimes the research that Lily does for me, I get, my mind gets blown too. She has also discovered a supernova, which is the death of a star as it's dying. That would be a lot of discoveries for any astronomer, but Gonzalez was patient and sat for hours, days, months, and years of studying our sky. So she was all about the details. That work paid off again when she discovered a brown dwarf or a super planet in our solar system. She again, oh sorry, she is still alive and has written several books about the impact of space and the night sky on herself and humanity as a whole. So currently on our planet, good stuff. And finally, anyone who says that women can't do science or math are just plain wrong. Women scientists have been around forever and will continue to be around. Women are just as capable as men and are still breaking boundaries. For example, Dr. Johnson is one of the first black female chemical uh, oceanographers in the country and the first black person to receive a doctorate in oceanography from the Texas A&M. Uh, Johnson also uses her love of the ocean to talk to others, including kids. Sorry about that. <laughs> she holds conferences, meetings, and classes to teach adults and kids about many different topics, but still enjoys teaching about the ocean the most. And she once said, the ocean was like this undiscovered world right here on our planet. Underwater, it seemed to have that there was no boundaries. 
And the idea of being able to do something I love and help others realize their dreams is the perfect solution for me and the perfect dream, which I think any of us can hope about our jobs. As Stacy Espinoza, one of the candy scientists of the Mars Wrigley Confectory, Confectory, yeah, they make candies. Uh, they make m and Skittles, Orbit Gum, and she once said, STEM isn't just a path, it's a platform. It creates a foundation of skills that gives you the power to seize a universe of opportunities, even ones you might not be aware of yet. Stacy Espinoza uses science to create new flavors and kinds of candy. She loves making gum and mint flavors, and she says it's a little bit science and a little bit art. So even if you love candy, you can make be a scientist. Um, so now we're going to talk to my friend, Bree Oatman. She lives in South Dakota and works at the Discovery Center. And I'm going to get Bree's face up here. Oh, hello. Hi, Bree. How are you? I'm good. How are you today? Good. Hey, I'm going to close this door real quick so it's not so loud. Bree, can you tell us what your full title is in life? Oh, sure. So um, my name is uh, Dr. Bree Oatman. Um, I have a PhD in science education, and I'm actually currently working on a master's in chemistry. Um, I am the education director for the South Dakota Discovery Center, which is basically a science center. We have an exhibit hall, um, and then we, uh, we rent out or loan out curriculum to teachers. So we do a lot of professional development with teachers. Uh, we partner with schools to help build capacity for STEM education across the state. And um, we do that a lot of a lot of different ways. Um, I kind of I go in a whole lot of different directions with a lot of projects, and um, it's a lot of fun. And I was a teacher prior to that. Can you, how, can I you? know Jamie. We were in grad school together to get our teaching certificates at Gonzaga. Can you hold? Years ago. Can you hold up on your fingers how many degrees you just labeled off there? How many degrees do you have? Okay. I have one, two, three. Uh, I think I have four and another one in the works. And I can explain why. I mean, I'm, I, it's not just that I'm a glutton for punishment, I suppose. I mean, well, I can talk about you know, my career st strategy. Yeah, the best thing when, when we were looking for women in science, you were like one of the first names that came to my head because I was like, oh, I know somebody. So um, maybe uh, if you could tell us a little bit maybe about your past, like what led you to be this glutton for punishment or why you, why you went this route, that would be awesome. All right. Um, well, first of all, I love learning and I love, absolutely love science. Um, and so, um, and I've always loved science from when I was really little. And um, I think um, what really kind of inspired me to kind of go to graduate school beyond getting, becoming a teacher um, was that I was actually, I am from Washington state. And um, I was living in Spokane and I was teaching on the Spokane Indian Reservation. And um, I really just became very committed to kind of the, to the work of making sure that science education is equitable and inclusive for all students. And uh, my research focused on how to kind of create culture, like how to bridge the different cultures. So thinking about um, how indigenous people see the world and do science in their own way and how that has things that are similar and things that are different to how we kind of do it from our, what we call the Western science, which is kind of what we're all used to learning in school where you have like your question hypothesis procedures and so on. Um, and so that's what I went to graduate school for initially. And um, I still don't know what I want to really do when I grow up, I guess. And so um, sometimes I think, oh, maybe I'll be a professor and I'll prepare future teachers. And other days I think, well, I could be a STEM director and work kind of like with in a university where they're doing research. Um, and so that's kind of what motivated me to get, um, and I wanted to be able to teach at a college level as well with science classes, not just education classes. And so that's what motivated me to go back to school to do a master's in chemistry. And this program is actually specifically for educators. So a lot of what we do, we're learning the chemistry, but we're thinking about it in terms of how do we teach this to other people, um, which has been really fun and um, I, I'm enjoying it. And it's it's actually, this is a kind of a great, I don't know if your audience is mostly uh, youth or families, 
I'm guessing that's kind of who your audience is. And so um, this is a story I like to tell my students. Um, you know, we all have a story we tell ourselves about whether we're smart enough to do something and whether or not we're, you know, we're good at something. And um, when I was in eighth grade, I was in algebra. And that meant when I got to high school, I was in geometry as a freshman and then algebra two. I should have graduated high school having taken calculus. Well, I got to algebra two and suddenly math became very hard and confusing for me. And it just, I just completely shut down and I disconnected from it completely and I hated it. Um, and so by the time I got to college, I had, a, I, I had convinced myself that I wasn't good at math, which clearly looking back on it now is crazy because if I wasn't good at math, I wouldn't have been able to be ahead a whole year when I started high school. Um, and then I got to college and I kept telling myself that, right? And so I made decisions like, well, I'm not going to take the MCAT to get into medical school because I'll never pass, right? Like I would keep telling myself this. But at the same time, I wanted to do advanced science classes and I had to have certain requirements, like you have to have at least pre-calculus. And so I did a self-paced, self-taught pre-calc class. And so clearly, and I, I tested out a trick. So clearly I can do math, right? But I kept telling myself, I'm not good at this. And then when I became a teacher, I can't teach physics. There's too much math. And here I am now teaching a survey physics class for college as an adjunct professor. And I'm in a master's program in chemistry, which basically when you get to graduate school for science, it's really just math. It's just a whole lot of math. <laughs> So that, uh, I love that because you hear that from kids all the time that I'm not good at math and you are the perfect example of like being a little bit easier on yourself and maybe just, you know, taking it, taking a chance and not, not being stuck in your 12 year old brain or 15 year old brain. So, um, yeah, I mean, so it's helpful to kind of maybe just write that down sometimes. Like what are those things you tell yourself and then rip it up, awesome. light it on fire under adult supervision, something <laughs> that just kind of helps you like decide like, okay, I'm just not going to, I'm not going to believe this anymore. And yeah. it's really not being about not smart enough. Sometimes it's hard work Yeah, and it's, hard, that's good for us to be challenged. Oh, we talk about it all the time. Science is hard. It's, it's messy and it's dangerous sometimes. So. Um, I guess it's because our talk is all about women in science, one of the questions I have for you is, what have you experienced being a strong female in the science career that uh, I guess kind of highlights how under underrepresented we as a gender are? Um, well, I guess um, I think in particular, you see this a lot, like even just thinking about it in terms of like, uh, science educators at a high school level in particular, and the number of men versus women who teach physics, for example, at a high school level, there's certainly less women who, who teach physics, um, and probably less that teach chemistry as well. Um, I also, like, I've done, I've actually been able to do research experiences where I got to be in a lab for, in the summertime, and I've done some field work where I was out caving, collecting samples, and doing things, and, and, and almost in all those situations, um, you know, I'm, I'm surrounded by men. Um, and so uh, I feel like, I guess for me, I think about it in terms of um, just kind of you. I, I was actually thinking about this the other day because I was just getting dressed to go to like a Kiwanis meeting, for example, um, which is uh, like a service organization. And um, I totally prepared myself in a different way to go into that meeting than I would if, if I was just going into a staff meeting where I work or meeting with my friends, right? Like I, I paid more attention to my appearance and all these other things. And I knew exactly what I was doing, um, you know, and I, I kind of laughed at it, but I was like, well, you know, I'm playing the game. Like this is part of this game that I have to play. But it also means that I'm not gonna just be, I'm not gonna be afraid to stand up for myself and to say, speak truths when I hear things that are, you know, that might be sexist or, or whatever. But um, I guess, yeah, it's just really more of that kind of like, sometimes I feel like I have to like, prove myself a little bit more and I and I guess the one big thing I noticed and this really just kind of came up this last year with our election is you know the the first lady in the White House has a doctorate in education and immediately people were going after her like qualifying whether or not that was even a valid degree and should she even use the title doctor and um you know up until that point I really just didn't use the title because I kind of felt like I didn't want to set myself apart and I wanted to be more kind of personal, but now, but then, then I was kind of like, no, I am Dr. Oatman. You can call me Dr. Oatman. And I got a little feisty about it. Um, 
So I, I feel like that really kind of plays into the gender piece, is, uh, especially in terms of gender representation. Um, and then I'm learning a lot more about it too, in addition to thinking about not just like women in science, but also thinking about uh, transgender women and men in science and non-binary um, people in science and STEM. And, um, and now that's something we're focusing on in our workplace. So where I work, we're making sure that we are, we're um, trying to include biographies of different people that reflect a whole lot of different backgrounds. And I actually just got a grant about all about gender representation in STEM that I'm working on right now cool. with the work that we Yeah. Very cool. Well, um, I know that you have to get to another meeting, but I wanted to say if you could talk to, let's say, a 12-year-old girl who, or 13, maybe middle school, maybe going into high school and is finding herself perhaps not as inspired in science as she should be or thinking she shouldn't do it, what would be the thing that you would say to that girl to help her kind of push through? Um, well, I would, I would say, you know, find, find, a find a mentor, find a, somebody, another uh, woman or another girl uh, who is her age that she can, you know, to, to do projects with, um, look for other organizations outside of your, so if you're feeling kind of that, that uh, weight on you is kind of within the school context, find some organizations in your community that you might be able to get involved with, like Girl Scouts, 4-H, other organizations where you can then do the things that you like to do and then kind of be more independent in how you explore those topics. Um, look and see if there's any kind of women in science type organizations or events happening in your community. And um, But yeah, and I would say if you find a mentor, that's really going to be a, a really great opportunity because then you have somebody you can kind of vent to and someone you can look to for inspiration and to ask questions um, and who can help you find those resources to help you be connected. And, you know, and, and don't be afraid to just kind of branch out and do your thing. Like I have a good friend in Ellensburg whose daughters were involved in robotics when they were about that age. And they got really frustrated because they kept getting kind of pushed to the side. And it was like, hey, why don't you just go design the t-shirt kind of scenario? Um, and they were just like, forget this, we're doing our own thing. And they started their, uh, it's called Nerdy Girls. So everybody should check it out. <laughs> but they check, they designed their, uh, an entire robotics thing just for girls. They started a nonprofit. Um, it's, it's awesome. And it was just started by a couple of youth who just felt really frustrated with them not being able to be fully included and welcomed at the table. And they went and did their own thing. So, um, yeah, there's, and there's lots of us out there that'll support you. Awesome. Well, yeah, and I'll stand up here so I can be in the camera. Am I in the camera? Um, we have to kick Bree out of here so she can go to our meeting. But just so you guys know, if you're watching this in the replay and you have a question for Dr. Oatman, uh, you can put that in the comments. You guys can um, watch our YouTube videos. And if you have questions or comments, put a comment and we can make sure we direct them right directly to her. So uh, I'm going to say thanks to Bree and say have a great day and yeah. keep doing what you do. Thank you so much. I hope we can collaborate in the future on some citizen science. For sure. Stuff. Count, really me in. Count me in. Okay, Facebook world. Do we have any more people joining or comments or questions? Sweet. So I am going to say goodbye for this week. And then we guys, we guys, we will see you next week. Thanks, guys.